Good morning. Welcome to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't show. This is Sean. Just ain't so. This is Sean with Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. If you're new to the concept, I seek to meet every morning at around 7.30 a.m., at the Livery Session Proof Now Facebook page for what I call a daily nugget of wisdom. Uh, yesterday I read this quote uh, in a book that I'm reading, and it is believed to be a quote by Mark Twain, but after I researched it, I don't think it is Mark Twain. And I don't know, as I was sharing this with my wife this morning, I don't think Mark Twain would say the word ain't, because that just wasn't a word available in his time or his day, as far as I can tell. Anyway, here's the quote. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I hope you understand where this is going. But as I read this yesterday, I thought about the Starbucks, the Philadelphia Starbucks incident that happened last week. And here are 10 things that I learned from observing how people have responded to the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. Now, for those of you that may not be aware of the incident, uh, I have just a few facts. And basically what's happened is two men, black men, uh, were in Starbucks in a Philadelphia location. And from what I can see and, and uh, understand, they were asked to, to leave Apparently, they hadn't bought anything yet. Uh, from their perspective, what has come out to the public is that they were waiting for a friend before they go ahead to order anything. There are mixed stories on this. Some have a different story. And so since I wasn't there, I'm going to just tell you, uh, I'm going to give you the facts. I put it in quotes as I understand them to be. And so at some point, apparently the manager of the store warned or requested or asked or even commanded, I don't know, suggested, fill in whatever word you want to use, these, uh, told these two men to, that they need to leave the store if they're not ordering anything. And they insisted that they weren't, hadn't done anything wrong and they were not going to leave. They were waiting for a friend to show up. Well, at some point, this manager um, got bothered by this, I guess, this dialogue, and eventually said, uh, decided to call the police. Now, I overheard the parts of the 911 call. There were a few 911 calls, and uh, she didn't sound upset to me. She didn't sound, uh, there was no way that I could judge the heart of this woman by what I heard on the 911 call. But uh, the only thing I heard was her saying that uh, there were two black men or two men. She didn't identify their race. There were two men in the Starbucks uh, location, at her location, that had not, that, that would not leave. She had requested that they leave and, and they would not leave. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to speak about 10 things. Good morning, Vicki. Good to see you as always. 10 things that I've learned while I sit back in one sense to observe uh, what's happened with the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. Ten things that I've learned. Uh, one thing I can say from listening to the call is as I listened to the police call, some of you have heard of the game, uh, I think Telephone is this game where, um, where, where uh, let's say you have ten people in a group or in a room, one person whispers a story of some kind in, in ear number one, in the, in the person number one next to them. By the time you get to the tenth person, that story has been changed. Now, most of us have played this game. And yet, when we're dealing with situations, we don't tend to factor in that, that facts can change along the way. Well, when I listened to the 911 call, it was obvious to me that from my perspective, that much of this got escalated as it was passed on between the police officers or the, 
the, yeah, the police officers and the person who was sending them on the call. I forgot who you call that person. All right. So the person who was calling and reaching out to the police officers to let them know that there was a quote unquote disturbance. And that's the word they used. Well, they used the word disturbance. All right. And so the call go, comes in initially as there are t two men here at Starbucks that I, we've requested to leave. They're not buying anything. And I don't remember the, all the details. So don't let me know that I missed something. I want you to hear the spirit of it, of what I'm saying. And the, the, the manager then requested that we need a police officer to come to, to get them to leave or to take them out or to escort them out. You fill in the blank, however you like. It was interesting to me that as I listened to the call from the dispatcher, and there were a number of calls from the dispatcher, that the, 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 the intensity of this thing began to change with each instruction to the police officers. And so it was obvious to me, I understood why... If this is a possibility, if, it, if this happened, that those, the police officers came in with more of a mindset that we have some sort of a disturbance, and so we're ready to put that thing down, right? And so, for whatever that means, I think the same thing happened in some degree, on, uh, sadly, with, with the gentleman that was killed a few weeks ago in his grandmother's backyard. Um, by, by saying that does not mean that I believe that police officers or anyone in authority cannot abuse their authority. Any authority in any position can be abused, whether it's a parent, it's a pastor, it's a teacher. We've seen stories of all kinds, uh, whether it's judges, even presidents, prime ministers, uh, authority can be abused. And so I am not ignorant to believe that that, that, um, that, that it's not possible that these police officers may have done things wrong. What I, am, what I do find interesting is as I listen to the 911 calls, what I've discovered is that things got escalated in how the dispatcher passed on the information to those the police officers that were given the instruction to go to the Starbucks. And so, again, the quote, good morning, Tiffany. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you this morning. Again, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. This is a quote some believe to be by Mark Twain. Based on my research, I don't think it is Mark Twain. And um, again, because the word ain't is used, uh, that again gives me a reason also to believe that this was not a Mark Twain quote. For whatever it is, the quote is not mine, but there are insights that... Uh, came to my mind, or nuggets of wisdom. As I thought about this quote, I was reminded of the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. And I'm going to take a few moments to share 10 things that I learned while observing the response of the public to the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. Here, here are the 10 things that I've learned. Number one, this is an emotional subject. Number two, Everyone has an opinion. Number three, we are all experts. Number four, blame is easy. Number five, mercy is precious, yet difficult to exercise. Number six, erring on the side of facts can be dangerous. It often lacks empathy and facts can be misleading. Number seven, the media loves selling and doesn't need much to produce what it loves. Number eight, it can be challenging to be salt and light to the world and to the church. Number nine, most of us have... Oh, I didn't, I realized I didn't, um, I didn't formulate what I wanted to say there. I didn't, I didn't get it all clear. Um, oh, okay. I think what I wanted to say in number eight is most of us only have facts in pieces. We only have bits and pieces of, of this, uh, of this story. We only have bits and pieces of this story. So be slow to dot, dot, dot. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Number 10, sometimes, and this is the saddest part to me of these 
10 things that I've observed over the last few days. Sometimes the Christian community is not any different from the world in how it responds. Sometimes the Christian community is not any different from the world in how it responds. So these are the 10 things that I've learned from observing the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. Darshel, good morning. Good to see you. Father, I want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to look again into your word for just a few moments. I ask again that I would decrease and that you would increase, that you would fill me with your spirit. I confess, Lord, that I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I am in need of all things. In one sense, I know nothing when compared to your infinite knowledge. And so, Lord, I come to you as a finite being with limits, uh, who's often flawed in so many areas. And I'm asking that you would strengthen my desire to please you. I pray that you would cleanse me from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, that you would give me the grace to perfect holiness in the fear of God, that you would grant me the desire to walk in truth, Lord, to be filled with your spirit, to walk in wisdom, to walk in love, and may the words that I speak today be spirit and life. And I pray, O oh God, that those that need to hear something that's contained in this information that I'm going to share, that you would allow them to be exposed to this material. For your name's sake and for your glory, Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, here are 10 things I learned from the Philadelphia Starbucks incident, from observing how people have responded to this incident. The first thing I want to do is I want to take just a few, uh, just a minute or so to tell you what I think about when I read, read the comment or the, the quote that I mentioned here. And here is the quote again. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Now on the surface, this quotation is seeking to emphasize a point. It's almost like the way you and I should think about Proverbs. What are Proverbs? Proverbs are short, pithy statements that are in most cases true. So it takes a truth, a broad truth, and summarizes it in a way that is easy to understand. For example, talk is cheap. That's a proverb. And what that's telling us is words without actions have no value. If all I do is speak about what I'm going to do, but I don't do what, I'm going to say, what I say I'm going to do, that's cheap. Talk is cheap. And, the, and like Proverbs, often quotes, unless they are from the Word of God, from my perspective, they can break down when, when, um, when applied to every situation. In other words, they're not accurate for every situation. For example, it, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. Well, if you understand the Bible immediately, your mind should think of Hosea 4, 6. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. And so, yes, what you don't know can often get you into trouble. What you and I don't know often gets us into trouble. And so it's important to be knowers and to know things. And in the case of this incident in Philadelphia, this Starbucks incident, a lot of people are in trouble for not knowing all the facts by jumping to conclusions. But what I really like about the end part of this quotation that I resonate with and I agree with is this. It's what you know for sure that, ain't, that just ain't so. You can add that gets us into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. My, the point there is we often don't have a humble approach to things because we believe we know. And unfortunately, we don't know often what we don't know. That's one of the biggest problems in life, in my opinion. It's one of the biggest challenges in relationships that we don't know what we don't know. And so because we don't know what we don't know, there's a tendency, and I'm guilty of this often, to speak with greater authority than we have on a matter because we don't know all the facts. We don't know all the information. And even if I know the facts, facts can be misleading because facts are not always the whole truth. Facts are based on observation. What you and I see and hear and feel can be subjective. It's not always objective. It is not always the truth. Because facts are, again, based on our limited 
ability to see, to discern, to perceive, to hear, to feel, to sense. And we can't trust these things fully because they're not always accurate. The fact to the police officers a few weeks ago, according to some of them, was they pulled up to a home. They had heard from the dispatcher that there is someone breaking windows in homes that's going from house to house trying to break into houses. And so they had a perception based on the 911 call before they arrived at the location of the man's grandmother's house. That was a fact for them. It was also a fact for them, based on the 911 call, that once they got to this location with that already innate perception, some would call it a bias, I wouldn't call it a bias, I think it lacks putting yourself in the other person's shoe, because this happens to all of us all the time. The fact was, they got there, it was dark, and they assumed, based on their perception before they got there, that what they saw in the hand of the gentleman, which happened to be an eye, a phone, they assumed it was a gun. And they killed him. Should they be held accountable? I say yes. Even the Bible talks about someone being slain, even if it's by accident, even if you don't have all the facts. There are different laws in Scripture as to whether or not someone, how someone should be dealt with from a place of, of judgment and condemnation or um, a punishment based on whether they understood or knew what they were doing was wrong or they didn't. For example, if you cause your neighbor's animal to fall into a ditch and die, you don't deal with that in the same way as if you presumptuously and you intentionally caused harm to someone's animal and killed it. Anyway, I wanted to provide this as a context to say that facts can be misleading and we'll look into that a little more in a moment. So it ain't what you, you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so that gets us into trouble. And the only thing I want to say about this, the last thing is, though I love this quote and I, it, resonate, it resonates with me for the purpose of this conversation this morning, not every part of the quote is completely ac accurate. Darshel says, sometimes we speak about situations before we know because we may be emotional about the situation. And you are totally correct, das Darshel. And so that gets right into 10 things I learned from the observing the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. The first thing I learned from this incident, it's not just this incident, but I've seen it over and over again when things happened in the news, that... The first thing I've learned from observing this is this is an emotional subject. This is an emotional subject. What makes this an emotional subject? Well, what makes it emotional for many is, one, the subjects in, in, in this situation are African American or black, whatever term you feel comfortable with. It doesn't matter to me. I don't, none of us are African American. Most of us are not African American because we were not born in Africa, but if you want to make the case every human being is an African American that lives in America, because we were all born in America according to Genesis. I mean, we were all born in Africa according to the book of Genesis, right? Adam, every man came from Adam, and Adam was born in, uh, in Africa, right? So, anyway, Ac Africa is a continent, not a country. So, but... This is an emotional subject because of the subjects involved. They're, they're, they're black. And unfortunately, there has been too much things that have been happening in the black community uh, that uh, so much has been racial, much of it has not. And so people move to, I've had racial stuff happen to me. And so I know these, I know that race, racial, ra you know, racism is a sin. And, uh, uh, and we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so we should not be surprised that people can sin against people. I, none of us would be surprised that someone lied. None of us would be surprised that someone stole. So why can't a police officer lie? Why can't a quote-unquote victim lie? Both sides can lie. And so this is why the Christian 
needs to lead by example and be more salt and light, and we'll get to that in point number eight. So this is an, it's an emotional subject because the narrative that came to the world, that came to us, the first thing I heard about this, the first thing I heard about this thing was that it was racially motivated. And so there was a narrative from the beginning, based on my beginning, what I heard. By stating that, I'm not saying it wasn't racially motivated. All I am saying is, I don't know the heart of the person that made the call. I don't know the, I don't know the heart of the person that made the call. And so, this is an emotional subject. And since it is an emotional subject, emotional subjects can be very dangerous. They can be very dangerous. Why? Because the Bible says we are to be sober-minded. Sober-minded. The phrase sober, I'm just looking it up real quick because I didn't do this. Right? The, the phrase sober, to be sober, that word is used 12 times, for example, in the New Testament. Just to be sober. Really quick. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Ephesians, one of the most, um, one of the most important or, uh, scriptures about being filled with the Spirit, says that we should not be drunk with, with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The opposite of being drunk is to be sober. Sobriety of mind and heart and will and emotions is important. Paul says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Now, I am often guilty of being overly emotional in a particular situation which doesn't allow me to take the time to get all the facts. Once you go into a situation with emotion, with hurt, with feelings, it can affect how you respond to others. And things only get uh, exalt, uh, um, uh, amplified there. Titus 2, 6 says, Young men likewise, exhort the young men to be sober minded. Titus 2, 4, teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. Titus 2, 2, that the older men, they should be sober. Um, when it's addressing the leadership in the church, that, or the wives of leaders in the church, that they should not be slanderers, that they should be sober, faithful in all things. And so what's the idea of being sober? The idea is being under control. The idea is, is not being overly agitated, not being overly emotional about a situation or thing. The idea is uh, having a sense of temperance, and so you're not moved to the left or to the right without having clarity of mind and heart. The word sober, according to Webster, is temperate in the use of spiritous liquors. So he first applies it to drinking. Habitually temperate as a sober ma man. To live a sober, righteous, and godly li life. Not mad or insane. Not wild. Okay, so you get the idea. A person who is sober-minded is not easily irritated doesn't get easily angered. And this reminds me of Titus 2, uh, 11, which says the grace of God that has appeared to us, that brings salvation, teaches us to live soberly. See, the grace of God teaches us to live soberly. And so the child of God should have, even if it's only 1%, should have a percentage of sobriety, not in reference to alcohol alone, but sober-minded in one, dealing with the devil, because that's the only way to deal with him, to be sober and to be vigilant, to be alert, to be aware of your surroundings, to not be easily deceived, that's all part of being sober. But the other thing that I want to emphasize is to be temperate. To be temperate. To not be a mad person, to not be insane, to not be wild, to not be someone who is out of control. And often if you read and look at the quotes of how people have responded to this situation, there doesn't appear to be among some, in my opinion, a willingness to even hear the person on the other side. People become emotionally moved and it's seen in the comments. And the Bible says that we are to be angry without cause. Scripture makes it very clear that we should be angry and sin not. It says that... 
uh, if um, let me let me let me quote it here. Let me just read it from the scriptures. Um, I usually can quote this, but I am not right now. My mind is on focusing on what I want to say, so it's hard to think about this. But but many of you, many of you know Jesus' words. You've heard it said. Um, Jesus dealing with the subject of anger. And let's see, Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5. I just want you to see what Jesus is referring to. See, it's emotions that cause us to call people names. And that's what I want to address. Something is wrong if you and I can't disagree without me calling you names. Without me getting so angry and emotional, let's call it emotional, so emotional about the situation or your response that I have to call you names. And I've seen this happening. Matthew 5, 22, I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, that means to call someone a name, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So in scripture, to call someone a fool, not in the sense of identifying a fool, someone who's not wise, but to call a person a fool with emotion, with disdain, with a sense of malice, hatred, envy, all of these sinful things of the heart. God says, when you do that, you're in danger of hell fire. And so I observed by looking at how people have responded to this is that this is an emotional subject. And my encouragement to the child of God and to myself is that God doesn't have a problem with us being emotional, but he does have a problem with us calling people names sinfully. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And scripture says that we should have no evil speaking. And evil speaking has a lot to do with how we talk to and about others. And sometimes people are are, are, are sinning, in Matthew 5.22, they're breaking this law of God by what they tweet, by what they post, by what they uh, say. All right? And so this is an emotional subject. Secondly, everyone has an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. And I'm saying there's nothing wrong with everyone having an opinion. Why? Because we are all individuals. This is a quote-unquote free country. And it's one of our constitutional rights. Right? The first amendment is that I should have a right to free speech, that I should be able to state publicly what I believe, what I feel, what I think. You should not get angry with me because I believe it's okay to be a homosexual. You shouldn't get angry with me because I believe it's okay to abort babies. Because I say that. Now you can get angry at the act, you can get angry at what people are doing, but... People have a right to say and believe what they want to believe, and they will be held accountable by God for what they say and what they believe. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? My point here is, the only time I see Jesus getting angry with people in Scripture is when they are hypocritical, when they are in leadership, when they know better, they're teaching people better, but they're doing the opposite. You don't see him getting angry with sinners in general. You see him getting angry, and often you see even in the Old Testament, much of God's anger, it's not only, it's not limited to, but much of his anger is toward his own people. Why? Because they've hewn out new, different cisterns. They're not following me, God. They're following other gods. They, they have idols. All right, so everyone has an opinion, and my point here is, since everyone has an opinion... I'm okay with, with people airing their opinion. I'm okay also with telling you I disagree with your opinion based on what I understand. But by God's grace, I am going to disagree in a manner that still respects who and what you are. And, and uh, do it in a way that I'm seeking to win you over to my view. He that wins souls is wise. The third thing I've learned is that we are all experts. And this is where the problem comes in. There's nothing wrong with all of us having an opinion. The problem becomes when we are all experts. We're all experts. And what I mean by that is our approach now is 
our view can only be the true view and everyone else's view is wrong, you know what? If I have that view in my heart, that's not the problem. There's nothing wrong in one sense in my relationship with another if I believe that my view is right and your view is wrong. The problem becomes when I can't tolerate your view. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought, as he ought to know. What's the principle here? Well, the first thing, what's the context? The context is there is a debate in the Corinthian church. There is this, this, this strife and contention among the Corinthian believers or professing Christians. And they are divided among one another because each person, each group thinks that their view is right. One group understands that there is only one God and all the idols of the world are not real. The other group has the idea that, listen, we've come out of idolatry and in our old life, we ate meat that was offered to idols. And since we've repented, we don't want to eat meat now that's offered to idols. In other words, I used to be a Hindu. I used to be a Buddhist. And in that old life, we sacrificed animals to our deities. And then we ate the meat. We celebrated. We feasted. We enjoyed the meat. And it became a festival for us in one sense. As a way to, to appreciate and to, uh, to, to expect the gods, in small g in quotes, to hear us and to answer us. And so for some of the Corinthians, when they were given meat that may have been offered to idols, it was sinful for them because in their own mind and heart or their conscience, that was violating God's word. Because God says to come out of idolatry, separate yourself from the world. And so in their own mind, they were, their understanding was true. But true is not more important than grace. Truth is not more important than grace. Truth is not more important than love. The Bible says God is love. God is light. God is holy. I don't recall anywhere in the Bible where it says God is truth. Now Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But what has happened often is we exalt truth above grace. And the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. We should marry both together. My point here is, our understanding of truth with another brother or sister in the Lord should not divide us or put walls between us so that we dishonor God and become a bad witness to the world. And so what the Apostle Paul had to do with the Corinthians is he had to say to them, I know what you know is truth or you believe is truth. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8, Now as touching things offered unto idols, Paul says, the Holy Spirit says to Paul, we know that we all have knowledge. We're all experts. We all have knowledge. We all have an opinion on a matter. We all believe our perception, our view, our belief, the way we communicate our belief is truth. And there's a lot of nuances there. Because you can believe something is true, but the way you communicate that may not get across to the person what you believe. And so even in that, we can be flawed. My knowledge could be right, but my communication could lack something. So, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Paul says we all have knowledge. But knowledge is a problem. Why? Because knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge makes us experts. Knowledge makes us unwilling to hear the words of another person. I know this for a fact because, it, because it's done that to me for years. Knowledge puffs up. But charity edifieth. See, in one sense, love and charity is more important than knowledge even if that knowledge is true. Why? Because charity 
is what shows that we are like God. Love is what demonstrates that we're like God. The devil knows the truth, and the truth doesn't save him. The devil understands the truth. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble. They know that Jesus is the Christ. Lord, have you come to condemn us? I'm paraphrasing before the time the demon said as Jesus walked in all of his glory in the presence of demons about to cast them out. They understood that he was who he is. Truth is not more important in my opinion. And knowledge is not greater than the grace of God and or the love of God. That's why the Bible says, all that love are born of God. It doesn't say all that know and understand the truth are born of God. You and I can know the truth and still be lost. So, yes, we're all experts. We all have knowledge. But knowledge can be a problem because it puffs us up. It makes us haughty. It makes us arrogant. It makes us unwilling to be easily entreated. We're not willing to hear what others have to say. And so... If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing. The key word here that I would circle is the word yet. It doesn't say he knoweth nothing. You can know stuff, but if you're closed-minded, if you're unable to communicate with others without a meek and a quiet spirit. The Bible says Jesus was meek and lowly of heart. Jesus wasn't humble at heart. He was meek and lowly. Of heart, And so he could be reasoned with. He could have discussion. Even in the temple at 12 years old, he didn't go in there as the authority, the sole authority, and shut everything down and shut everybody down. If you read Luke 2, it says that he asked them questions and they asked him questions. And so there was open dialogue. He was not the expert in one sense in the room, though the tension of that is that when he spoke, he spoke with authority. And they had never heard someone speak in such a way. And so there is the tension. The tension is we should speak with authority because the basis of what we believe should be coming from the word of God. But we should be meek and lowly of heart in how we speak, how we commune, communicate, and so on. So the this third, this third thing that I understood and learned from observing the Philadelphia Starbucks incident is that we are all experts. And because we are all experts, there's a tendency to be puffed up by our knowledge and not to be loving in our interaction. The fourth thing that I understood and I observed from this story is that blame is easy. Blame is easy. Some people blame the two men for not leaving. They should have just left. You know, they should have just left. If they were told, hey, you're not a customer, you haven't bought anything, you should leave. Some blame the manager. The manager should have never made the call. Some blame the police officers. The police officers should have understood that when they arrived at Starbucks, they should have asked questions to these two men and, uh, and, and helped maybe the manager to see these guys are real customers. They're waiting for their friend to come. I think one, some stories say that the friend showed up while the police officers were there. Some blame all the Starbucks. So all the Starbucks in the world should be protested. I mean, this is ridiculous to me. So all Starbucks should be blamed for one person. Some blame the policy of Starbucks. So Starbucks shouldn't have a policy. They shouldn't have any rules. Are we saying that businesses should not have rules? Do you see how crazy this all gets? And now by saying what I'm saying... I'm not saying that people should not have blame placed somewhere. What I am saying is, my blame and your blame may not be God's blame. It is said that there are three or four views of ourselves, right? There's the view that we have of ourselves. There's a view that we think others have of us. There's the view that others have of us. And there's the view that God has of us. Well, in some cases, there can be four different perceptions. <laughs> There's my perceived view of what I think. There's what I think others think. There's what others think. And then there's what God thinks. And sometimes they're not always the same. And my point here again is, it's easy to blame. One of the reasons I posted and commended the CEO of Starbucks for the actions that he took is that 
To me, it showed leadership. It showed taking responsibility. He did not blame the manager who made the call. He didn't blame the police officers who showed up and maybe... He didn't blame the officers who showed up and who maybe didn't wait to get all the facts. He didn't blame uh, the policy. He blamed actually took responsibility for the policy and now is deciding to change the policy. Uh, the policy is that if you're not a customer, you shouldn't use the bathroom. And, and then the arguments are, well, I went to the bathroom at Starbucks and I was never... No one stopped me from going to the bathroom. And so it's racism. Is it? I don't know. I don't know the heart of the person. I've gone to Starbucks and used the bathroom. But I haven't, in most cases, had to ask someone for a key to use the bathroom. I just walked in and walked to the bathroom and used it. At other times, most of the time I've gone into Starbucks, it's usually when I'm out on the road, and so I'm usually in a suit. Could that be a factor? We live in a world that is governed and controlled by image. Are you not controlled by what you see? When I'm walking down the street, I remember uh, years ago, I was with a good friend of mine, and I went to, to stop at a Chinese uh, restaurant in, um, I think it was in Jersey, Jersey City, New Jersey. But this was a really bad area of Jersey City, New Jersey. Okay? And I walked in to this particular place, and... Guys were throwing dice in the restaurant, right? I don't call it a restaurant. It was, you know, the Chinese restaurant, you know, the walk-in ones. They were throwing dice. They were gambling. They were throwing money. They were loud and obnoxious. I mean, extremely loud. There were probably five or ten of them outside. There were probably six to maybe six, seven, eight inside. They were loud. They didn't care about anybody else in that place. And I felt a sense of, a fear that this, this is not wise for me to stay in this place. Now, I'm black, and they're black. And i got to tell you that often I have been in situations with my own black folks where I felt like I, this is not a good place for me to be and I need to leave. Very rarely have I felt that with white people. I don't think I ever felt it with white people. doesn't matter how much tattoos they have or rings or whatever. Now, you could say that's, an, that's a bias that I have. You could say that. Or you could say, when I lived in Brooklyn, I saw some things. When I lived in the Bronx, I saw some things. When I lived in Manhattan, I saw some things. When I lived um, in Queens, almost 10 years, I saw things. And do those things had an impact upon how I think. My point with all this is blame is easy. Blame is easy. It's easy to blame everyone. And I'm not saying that blame should not be given. But again, I am shocked by the amount of anger that people have, and the inability to reason. And blame is easy. Anyone can blame. Uh, some blame the media for the way the media has, has told the story. And there should probably be blame all across the board because we're all fallen. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all broken. Unfortunately, though, the point of all this and my thoughts, I'm not trying to guide the world I'm hopefully trying to impact how the church thinks, and it leads to my fifth point. The fifth thing I've learned from observing the Philadelphia Starbucks incident is that mercy is precious and difficult to exercise. Mercy is precious and difficult to exercise. When I say mercy is precious, mercy is like a commodity. Mercy is not easy to provide, and there is not a lot of mercy in our society, and unfortunately, even among the Christian community. And here's what I mean. The Bible says about God in Psalm 86, 15, Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. There's a way to be merciful and still be truthful. Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. James 3, 17 says the wisdom that's from above is full of mercy. 
Psalm 119, 64, the Lord, O Lord, is full of, the earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. The psalmist says, when I look at God's world, from his perspective and my interaction with God, he is full of mercy. And so what's my point here? Mercy is precious. I don't see any mercy from those who believe the woman was racist or that this was racially motivated. I don't see any mercy towards her. Let me stay here for just a moment. I'm not speaking to the world. I don't care what the world does. In one sense, God doesn't care what the world does. He says we're not to judge the world, but we are to judge, in one sense, the church. Let's just say it was racially motivated. Does that mean she needs to be fired? Does that mean she needs to be, um, her social media profiles need to be all um, filled with hate and hatred? Let's just say she was racist in her actions. I don't know because I don't know her heart. Does that mean now she, she should be despised, looked down upon, hated, um, called names, be spoken evil against, um, have information plotted, uh, posted all over the internet so that she can't get another job? Really? Are we that fickle? This society is not full of mercy. But the church of God should be full of mercy. And by mercy it means... Give a person a chance to realize that what they did was wrong. Give them a chance to say, I'm sorry. And there are times to show them grace. I suspect that we all do this with our children. I suspect if my child lies, I'm going to hold them accountable for the lie. Depending on the degree of the lie, I choose, I'll choose to show mercy or to provide punishment. But very often is my punishment going to be in one form that, like it's final. Because punishment often should not be punitive. It should be correctative. That's not a word. I just made that up. I think. I don't think it is a word. Right? Punishment is not just for the sake of punishing somebody. The goal should be to correct the behavior. And so when the goal, when, you're, when we love people... Our goal is to correct their behavior. This is why the Bible says all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. What's the goal of scripture? To punish us? To reveal to us punishment? To declare to us that we're going to hell? That's not the goal. That's the means. Hell is awaiting those who reject the truth, reject Christ, reject the scriptures. But that's not God's goal, for he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't write these things to just declare, this is the outcome for you, I'm done with you, see you later, sayonara. No, that's not God's goal. His goal is that the behavior would be corrected. God says to Joshua, I lay before you life and death. Choose this day whom you will serve. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he would repent, that he would return. God's goal is correction, not just punishment. And so why can't Starbucks take time to teach those who may be racist? This is not how you deal with people. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't judge beforehand. That's the virtue of the Bible. Why not teach that? Maybe people have to learn how to interact with others. There's so much more I can say here. The only thing I would say is mercy is precious and difficult to exercise. And God expects his people to be merciful. And mercy means that I don't always give you what you deserve. Mercy means that though you deserve punishment, I don't always measure out the punishment that you deserve. But also, my goal in the punishment should be, in general, to correct the behavior. Now, some punishment, the goal is, there's nothing that can be corrected, right? Jesus said of Judas, it would have been better for you that you haven't been born. Why? Because there's nothing else that can be done for Judas. There's no place that he'll be able to find repentance. 
Well, Judas is now a reprobate after he betrays Jesus. That's a doctrine in the Bible. There's possibility that you can get to a place that God turns you over to your sin and there is no hope to be saved. Hebrews 12 tells us that Ezra, though he sought for repentance with tears and sorrow, he found no place to repent. See, repentance must be granted by God. God has to give us repentance. It's not earned. It's not warranted. We don't work for it. We humbly bow before a sovereign God and ask him to show mercy upon us. And in that sense, he grants us the ability to say no to the things that we need to walk away from. And so mercy is precious and difficult to exercise. And so we should desire to grow in mercy. Well, I've been on for much longer than I want to be. And so Lord willing, I'll continue part two of this uh, with my other points. Ten things I learned from observing the Philadelphia Starbucks incident. Number one, this is an emotional subject. And so be careful of your emotions, especially if you're a child of God, because the Bible says every idle word that we speak will have to give an account to God for. That's a pretty sobering word. Secondly, or text, everyone has an opinion. Since everyone has an opinion, let's provide opportunity for people to give their opinion. And maybe we can lead by example that even when they get emotional, we show that we're obeying God's command that the servant of the Lord must not strive, but must be gentle and meek toward all men, that perhaps God would grant them repentance. 1 Timothy 2. Secondly, thirdly, we are all experts. And I don't mean that in a good sense. In my business, I want to be an expert. In my selling, I want to be an expert. I want to be seen as a trusted advisor. I want you to conclude, after we have a conversation, that this guy is an expert on marketing. And I need to use him to grow and to build my business. But in things where people are emotionally attached, I want to be wise in how I display my expertise. Fourth, blame is easy. Blame is easy. Blame is easy. And so I always applaud when I see leaders taking responsibility. And one thing I've taught my children, and I am still teaching them for more than 20 years, one of the first keys to success is ownership. Ownership. Taking full responsibility for the outcome. You may not have been the one to be blamed, but could you have done something different? Could you have said something different? Could you have responded different? We can't control the behavior, the words, the thoughts, the attitudes of others, but we can control our words, our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior. And so could the guys just decide to leave? Yeah. Would that have been just? Probably not especially if others of other racial or ethnic groups or others of other economic status dressed a certain way, look like business folks, uh, are not treated the same. But why should we be surprised? In James chapter 2, the church is rebuked for showing partiality. Could it be that this woman was just being partial and not racist? Is all partiality racism? James 2, what the church did is they put the Poor people, the homeless we'll call them in the back, and they put the rich, wealthy people in the front. And they were rebuked for showing partiality. Are you going to say they were racist against the homeless? Or are we going to say that there is a different nuance between whether something is racial or something is partial? Partial. See, God loves just weights and balances. Not only is homosexuality an abomination, those that use unjust weights and balances, God says that's also an abomination. In other words, if you work, if you deal with this person this way and deal with this person this way, a different way, God says that's being impartial. That's partiality. That's being partial. That's partiality. Not being impartial. You are showing partiality. That's not being just. And so maybe... She was guilty of just the same thing as James chapter 2. And there's no need to make it as emotional as it has become by calling it racism. 
It is so sad that anything now that happens to black people in our country publicly immediately is called racism. That's unfortunate because everything is not racism. Some things are people are being impartial. They're showing respecter of persons. Did not Saul, Samuel, have a partiality in his heart when he went to look for the new king? When Samuel went to Jesse's house, did, did he not have partiality in his own heart where he thought that the ideal king would be the, the, the older Jesse's sons, the bigger Jesse's sons, the taller, the more good-looking Jesse's sons? It can't be the little shepherd boy that's outside taking care of the sheep. Was he being racist against David? Or was he showing partiality against David? Something to leave for thought. And again, this is not for the world. If you are not a true Christian, you deserve to be angry and emotional and do whatever you want. But you will be held accountable by God for your actions and your behavior. But the child of God, we're to be salt and light. And if our responses to these things are exactly the same like the world, we are not showing a distinction and we are not demonstrating that we're salt and light. And Lord willing, tomorrow I will look at how erring on the side of facts can be dangerous Secondly, Lord willing, the media loves selling and, and, and doesn't need much to run with. Thirdly, number eight, sorry, it can be challenging to be salt and light to the world and the church. Number uh, nine, most of us have bits and pieces of this story, so we should be slow to, you know, we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And then number 10, sometimes the Christian is not any different in our responses than the world. And that's an indictment on the church. Again, this is Sean with Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. I want to end with that quote. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so that gets you into trouble. Let's be humble in our approach to this world. God bless you all. By the way, if you think something here can resonate with a friend or another Christian who maybe have um, responded in some of the ways that I've shared here in a way that may not have been Christ-like, uh, if there's a way that you can do it without them not being offended uh, or unnecessarily insulted, uh, maybe you want to tag them. Maybe you want to share this. All right. Uh, I am saddened by how often we as God's people don't look any different from the world and how we respond to these things. And I'm not throwing stones because I have been guilty. I said we as God's people. Uh, I am seeking by God's grace to be a better Christ-like child of God. All right, so um, if something here resonated with you, as usual, let me know one takeaway, some, one thing that you can take away from this that you're going to do, that you're going to that you're going to that you're going to apply to your life. We're not to just to be hearers. We want to be doers of God's word. So, what's one thing that you would take away from this uh, talk uh, this morning? I'd love to hear it, and uh, and uh, feel be be sure to share this with others. God bless you all.